Okay, so today we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to switch over to MRI. So we'll spend the rest of the course uh, talking about how MRI works. Um, so for before we get started, do, are there any sort of general questions people have? Yes? Can you also post uh, your lectures online? Yeah, this will be posted. Okay. I mean, the, the slides are online right now. Okay, but the, you record your video. Yeah, right? I'm recording it right now. Um, but there'll be a little more. It'll be a little more interactive. So there'll be some more interactive questions in this lecture. Okay. All right. So we have a lot to go over today. In fact, MRI. There's a lot of material in general. So um, today we're going to go over these different components. Uh, pretty much follows along with the book, uh, except we're going to talk about Chapter 13 first. Give you an overview of what the MRI system looks like, and then we'll start talking about things like spin, precession, RF excitation. Relaxation, block equation, and hopefully we'll get to the spin echo if not we'll get up on Wednesday. Okay, so for those of you who here has been in an MRI machine, anyone? Okay, so what can you tell me? What was that experience like? It was noisy. Okay, a little bit why it was noisy. Okay, and it's basically a tube. So I think you're probably in a tube. So. Uh, MRI is currently one of the standard, you know, clinical imaging modalities. So it's highly likely that everyone here will have an MRI sometime in your life. So if you ever haven't had one, you'll probably have one at some point. So it's sort of interesting that after you've taken the course and if you have an MRI, you'll have a better appreciation of, of what went on into the system. Let me just do that. Okay. So um, this is what an MRI system looks like, and there's really three coils that we're going to talk about. There's one coil here, which is sort of this, this here, which is essentially the main magnet. And that's going to create a very strong magnetic field. And we'll talk about that. Uh, there's a coil within that called the radio frequency coil. That coil has two jobs. That is going to transmit energy into the body and also receive energy from the body. All right. And then there's a third set of coils called the gradient coils, and their job is to add sort of linear gradients onto the field. And we'll talk about why that's important. So there's three coils that you're going to have to get familiar with. And then you have a patient table that delivers the patient in, and you have the patient who just lies there, hopefully rather still, um, while the scan is going on. So the, uh, this is sort of what the, the coils looks like. So this is sort of, the, uh, it's a solenoidal design. And so it's creating, the, the job of this main coil is to create a very uniform magnetic field along the axis of the coil. All right. And the coil is made up of superconducting wires. And so this is here, you're, we're seeing a picture of what the wiring looks like. It's essentially... Uh, niobium titanium filaments in copper. Okay, and this is surrounded by helium. So this is showing you here. There's this helium vessel that um, keeps everything uh, very cold. Okay, so we are using superconducting wire. And so what happens is when you get one of these MRI machines, they bring it to your center, they plug it into the wall, it ramps up the current. Okay, hopefully it gets to field. Once it's at field. Mm -hmm. They unplug it, and the field stays there, all right? and should stay there uh, for, for many, many years. Okay. So any questions up to now? All right. So one of the issues, and we'll talk a little bit about MR safety, is um, in, in, modern matter, in, in modern MRI systems, we have the main coil here, and then we have the shielding. Uh, shielding sort of countercurrents, and and the, their job is basically uh, you have the very strong magnetic field, and it's a solenoid, so the magnetic field can sort of it doesn't just stay in the magnet. The field lines go all around the magnet. Okay, so what's what would be the problem of sort of having a room with a magnet and fields all around that room? Are any safety issues with having sort of what are these fringe fields going all around? Anyone think of anything? Okay. So the idea is that, um, uh, does anyone here know anyone with a pacemaker? Okay. So some of you have pacemakers. So if, if you know someone with a pacemaker, if they walk through a magnetic field, okay, so what happens 
uh, if you go back to freshman physics, what, hap what does a time-varying magnetic field give rise to? Right, E field, right? So Faraday's law, right? So we know that E is proportional to dB dt, right? So if you just walk through a time, a varying magnetic field, you're going to induce currents um, in yourself, okay? And then if, you, if you have a pacemaker, that could redo the current in the pacemaker and, and script the pacemaker. So what we have to do is we have to shield the currents. We have these counterwound wires that then reduce the fringe field such that outside um, the room, the magnetic fields are, are quite reduced, okay? So if you ever go into an MRI system, for example, at our center, we have an MR system, and on the floor, we lay out where is the 5 Gauss line, where is the 10 Gauss line, so we actually know where the fields are. Okay. Uh, the other thing that anyone who does MRI uh, for a long time does is you will probably demagnetize your credit cards at least once. Okay. I've done it probably twice in, in my 20 years of doing this, and, um, and it's because basically you just get, you get a little close to the magnet and just demagnetizes your cards. Okay. And it's a real hassle, so after one or two times, you remember, just take everything out. Question? If you have a chip, would that do anything to it now? A chip? Um, that's a really good question. <laughs> Can you find out and let me know? <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. OK. Um, by the way, a lot of these slides are going to come from this, this site called MRIQuestions.com. It's this really wonderful site. It's a retired radiologist who just spends all his time writing this site. Uh, especially when you're going to look at, to do projects, this is a really good site to look at. And in general, whoops, is that going up? Okay, um, just a really good source of information. Okay, so what we talked about is in classic uh, technology, we need a lot of liquid helium. And that actually is a problem because there's actually, there, there are sometimes worldwide shortages of liquid helium, okay? Um, it's, a, it's a limited resource, and so there is this this move to sort of find how can you do MRI with less liquid helium. And so just looking online, and just last year, Philips introduced this uh, blue seal microcooling technology. I actually don't understand how this works, so if someone's interested in doing this for a project and explaining how this works, this would be another really good project. Um, so what they found is that instead of using 1,500 liters of liquid helium, they can use 7 liters of liquid helium. So that's quite impressive. Okay. So uh, I'm not sure if the other manufacturers are going to follow, but this is clearly uh, one of the things that they're hoping to differentiate themselves with. Okay, so let's talk a little. Yes, question. And that liquid helium is just a one-time setup at the beginning. Yeah, hopefully yes. So the, the modern magnets, basically, if we go back here, you have this sort of um, all this this machinery here. So basically. There's anytime you go into an MRI system, you hear this pumping sound, pum 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 pum. Okay, that's not the magnet. That's basically them trying to recover the helium. So essentially, as the lick, as the helium boils off, then they try to recondense it, and so you don't need much helium. Now, if things go wrong, then sometimes you need a, a helium refill. But ideally, if everything's working, you can recover most of it. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about magnetic field strength. So we're going to use two uh, units of magnetic field. Uh, one is Tesla, okay, um, and the other is Gauss, okay. Does anyone here know what who Tesla is named after? Not the car, right? So there's a guy named Nikolai Tesla in the late 1800s, early 1900s, who uh, did a lot of pioneering work in this. And then obviously Gauss is Carl Friedrich Gauss the famous mathematician. So these are named after those folks. So um, when we're talking about really big fields, typically uh, we will use the, the term Tesla. Okay, And Tesla is 10,000 Gauss. Now, if we were in Europe, we actually wouldn't use the term Gauss. We would use milliteslas. Okay? But since we're in the United States and we like to use lots of different units, we'll use Tesla and Gauss. Okay. Um, so just for comparison, the Earth's magnetic field here around San Diego is about half a Gauss. All right. So we're going to be talking about machines that are one Tesla, two Tesla, three Tesla, seven Tesla. So these are tens of thousands of times greater than the Earth's magnetic field. So these are really, really strong magnets. Okay. Um, when we talk about gradient fields, we will use Gauss because those fields are much weaker. So that's so typically when we talk about the main field, we'll talk about Tesla. When we talk about gradient fields, we'll use Gauss. All right. 
So this is a map here of the Earth's magnetic field. I forget when this was from, but uh, it's probably different now that the field keeps changing and at some points, every about 50,000 years, it flips over, okay? All right. So half a Gauss is then 50 microtesla, all right? So very small. Uh, that said, you actually can do MRI using Earth's magnetic field. So everything we're talking about here, uh, you can actually do. So sometimes, in, in, I think some, I think it was done in Russia, they actually set up this big MRI system in the field so that they could look for oil. Okay, so you can actually do MRI using just the Earth's magnetic field. Okay. So mostly what we'll talk about in this course are these sort of solenoidal magnets where you sort of go into the tube. But um, there are other designs. For example, there are these sort of this design where it's sort of like two pancakes and you sort of put your leg in there and the field goes this way. And then this design here where you sort of between these two donuts, okay? Uh, and so these are useful for uh, cases where someone might be claustrophobic or you just need to look at someone's arm or their leg. You don't really need to put them in the magnet. This one is actually useful. Uh, there's actually one of these in San Diego um, where they actually can use that to look at your lumbar spine and as you do different flexion, you, you can sort of look at the person where it's much harder to do that if you're in a tube. You really don't have much degrees of freedom. Right. But by far the most common clinical magnets you'll see are um, this magnet here. So in terms of fields, um, right now clinically, most of the magnets here at UCSD are either 1.5 or 3T. Okay, So that's how strong they are. Uh, there might be some lower field ones. Um, I don't know if this keeps going off. Let's see if I can... Oh, we'll deal with that later. Um, and then... Um, for research, then we can go to 3T and above. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some research magnets in this slide. So for example, here at UCSD, the highest field strength we have now is 3 Tesla. So we have a bunch of these, both clinically and research. Um, the highest FDA approved field is the 7 Tesla now. So this was just approved last year. Siemens has an FDA approved 7T uh, for head. Um, and then there are these other things that uh, mostly don't work. Um, these are research magnets. So this one here I've heard doesn't really work. I don't think this one works and I don't think this one works. This one I think supposedly is working. The Minnesota has always been at the, e at the head of getting really high field magnets working out. So this is a, a monstrous magnet. It's a 10.5 Tesla magnet. Um, when I asked them why they didn't go to 11.7, basically they had enough money for 10.5. So that's what they built. Okay, so uh, I forget how much money, this is probably a 15 or 20 million dollar uh, magnet. Okay, uh, it's basically roughly up to 70, it's basically about a, a, a million per Tesla. So if you want three Tesla, that's three million. If you want seven Tesla, seven million. And then there's typically siting costs. It might take several million to build a building and get all the shielding and everything. So it's not cheap, and so that's why people are always looking, are there cheaper ways of doing it? Yes? Yeah, so the main thing, which we'll get a little later, is sensitivity. So you're, you're going to be able to see things that you can't see at the lower fields. Okay, yes? So why is it that the highest Tesla's don't work? Well, these MRI systems are like amazing feats of engineering. Okay, so to have such a big field is, is not done very often. So, for, so it's just there's a, lot of, there's a lot of energy in that. And to get everything working is just not easy. So for example, this Neurospin at France, it, this was a project funded by the, the French government where uh, they had all these atomic physicists who were out of jobs, right? So they needed a project for them. So, and you know, you know, they, in accelerators, so I was just at CERN last year or two ago, and I visited you know, the accelerators. And they have all these magnets there. So they have a lot of magnet expertise in, in France and in Switzerland. So they figured, oh, let's just use all this to build a magnet. We'll just get a bunch of physicists together and, and, and build this. And I think like 10 years later, they're still trying to get it to work because there's just so much engineering know-how that's gone into it. Okay? There's just massive forces being applied by the magnet on itself. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to show this video, but you can watch this at youtube.com. Um, it's sort of a fun video to watch. It sort of convinces you of how strong the magnetic field is. Um, but let me just uh,
talk a little bit about, uh, if nothing else, I want you to leave this course with a respect for how strong the magnetic it, magnets are. So um, one thing is, in general, the magnet is never off. Okay? So once we power it up, it's on. And we don't turn it off at night. Okay? Because to, to charge it up is like a $50,000 proposition. So it's not like we're going to be you know, turning it on and turning it off. So um, sometimes the only sound you'll hear if the magnet's not being used is the cold head pumping the helium back. Mm -hmm. So like a bump, 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 bump. But we can turn that off sometimes, okay, if we're doing some diagnoses. And so even if we turn that off, the magnetic field is still on. So you must always realize that the magnetic field is on, okay? Um, unless you're told explicitly it's off, right? Um, the next thing is the, 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 there's a lot of, there are some dangers. MRI is very safe. I mean, I've been in an MRI system probably 100 times or so. And so it is very safe, but there are some dangers. And the main danger is it's a very strong magnetic field. So if you have anything metal, like if I took this water bottle, this would be just pulled out of my hands and drawn into the magnet. Okay, and there's no one here strong enough probably to hold on to it. <laughs> okay, it would just be ripped out of your hands. And in fact, I think it's been a while, but so there have been people killed. For example, I think maybe 10 or 15 years ago, there was a child in New York in a hospital who uh, was in the MRI system and someone for some reason brought an oxygen tank in. And it was just pulled right into the magnet and the first killed was, kid was killed instantly. Um, so it is very strong. Now, I've, I have seen some close calls in my life, so it's not something to, to uh, you don't, you just have to respect the field. Um, but let me give you guys a thought experiment. So let's say I came into um, the magnet and I had this in my hand, like I just wasn't thinking, right? And let's say this is me and I'm standing here holding my water bottle, okay? And let's say I'm, let's say I'm one foot away, okay? So this bottle will be ripped out of my hands, okay? And it's gonna go flying into the magnet. So what's gonna happen next? How far into the magnet will it go? Let's assume I'm right here at the center of the magnet, along the axis of the magnet, right? The water bottle's here, and it's ripped out of my hands. So it goes flying into the magnet. How far will it go? Will it go through the magnet and hit the wall, or will it? Yeah, so by conservation of energy, where must it stop? In the center, okay. So one possibility is it stops in the center. What's the other possibility? Any ideas? So this is, this. What, what other point has the same energy, potential energy as, so I'm here on one side of the magnet. What other point in this diagram has the same potential energy? The other side. It's gonna go to here. And then things get interesting. Where is it going next? Coming right back to you, okay? So uh, I've never had this happen, but I had. I was talking to someone who works in the field, and, and they actually had this happen to them, where they, and this is, and the problem is sometimes the more you're in the field, the more lax you get. So he was holding a wrench, just pulled out of his hands, and came back. And luckily he had moved a little bit, so it just clipped him, right? But it is, it's, it's that powerful, and it will just happen, it will be happened before you know it. Okay, so, uh, so you do have to have a healthy respect for the magnet. It's super strong. When you watch the video, you'll see some uh, examples of that. Okay. So, so just keeps going back and forth. Well, so there's gravity, right? Sure. So uh, eventually, it's going to clink, 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 clink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And it, and if you're not exactly at the center, then it's you know it's going to be yeah. So if you're perfectly in the center, it's going to go, you know, and then just. But eventually it's going to hit something. Yeah. yeah, so. So, yeah, you don't want to be the one to do that experiment. <laughs> Although, you, the only time you're allowed to do this experiment is when you're getting rid of your magnet. So, for example, my colleagues at Berkeley, they had this one magnet, which we, we actually worked on a little bit, which they just hated this magnet, right? So, I won't name the name of the manufacturer, but that manufacturer is now out of business, okay? So, so, basically, they had this party where they just threw things in the magnet. <laughs> before they decommissioned it, because they hated the magnet so much. So there's actually a video of that online, so we'll try to find that. 
Okay. All right. So that's the magnet, and so that's the main field. So the next thing we're talking about is the RF field. So this job, this this coil has a job of sort of putting energy into the sample and receiving energy back. So that's its job. It's essentially uh, you can think of it as an antenna. Okay. So there's typically one main field, one main RF coil called the body coil, which can transmit energy into the body and receive it back. Okay? And so it can be both transmit and receive. Now there are also possibilities you could put a localized coil. For example, here we see a knee coil where you could have a coil that just transmits into the knee and receives from the knee. Okay? And then you can also operate it in a mode where you just have the big coil transmit into the body, and then you can have these local coils, so these would be receive only. So RX will stand for receive, um, and so TR stands for transmit and receive, so it could also be written transmit and receive. All right? Uh, so that's the job of the RF coil. Um, so this is, for example, what an RF coil looks like before it's in the magnet. And the job of the RF coil, so there's here we see this, there's a main field here. That's from the main magnet. And the RF coil on transmit is going to, let me change this color, hold on just a minute. Okay. How do I get the, uh, the menu here? There we go. Okay, so this coil here, this, this RF coil is cr creating a field that's perpendicular to the main field. And it's much less than the main field. And we'll talk in a minute about why uh, that's the case. Um, typically, what you have is that the RF coil, uh, for example, you can have an RF coil that's as simple as a very simple loop wire. So that's just a simple coil. And typically, put an uh, oscillating current into that so that the field is down like this. Uh, but more standard coils are use what's called, so that's linearly polarized. So uh, more efficient coils use circular polarization where you'll actually have it so that the magnetic field goes around in a circle. Okay? And when we, today we're just going to give you sort of an overview. When we, go, when we visit RF transmit in, in, in the future, we'll go into more detail on, on how you do that. Um, so as I said, uh, one thing that's become very popular, especially over the last 10 or 15 years, is to do RF transmit with the main coil, and then you have receive-only coils, which are, you can put right on, on your body, and therefore they can be more sensitive to what they need to pick up. Uh, so there's lots of different designs, so these are some sort of geometries of those coils. Uh, here you're seeing a lot of other geometries. And there's even this one um, where you can just sort of have a whole array laid over the body. Okay? And they are working on now things that are flexible that you can even make clothing out of. And so you can actually, instead of having this very hard coil, you could just have a coil that's just like clothing and then you can just wrap it around yourself. All right. Uh, these are some coils. This is, for example, the coil we use a lot in a lot of our um, uh, research and this is a similar coil used on the Siemens system and this is the predecessor of that coil so this was the prototype the thing on top is the prototype coil that was built at Harvard Massachusetts General Hospital and then the the, the product of it is, is what you see at the bottom okay so as Professor McVeigh mentioned um, MRI is really unusual in the sense that it was started really in academia and since then there's just been a lot of co collaboration between academia and industry. And, and so things are very open in MRI. And in fact, a lot of the things that we'll talk about, the major advances were actually done by graduate students. Okay? So I'd say you know, a lot of the things over the last you know, 10 to 15 years, the major innovations all, are, all come out of PhD theses. Okay? Uh, so that's the RF coils. The next sort of coils we're going to talk about are the gradient coils. And these are meant to create linear gradients typically in the magnetic field. So there's going to be an X gradient, a Z gradient, and a Y gradient. Okay. This is sort of the schematic of what they look like. We'll talk a little bit more about that. 
this is actually what one of these looks like. Uh, and this is, I think this is the Siemens factory. So I was just there earlier this year. And so actually the, the actual coil designs are much more complicated. They're all sort of computer optimized. But we'll just give you a, a feel for what the basic coils look like. So as I said, there's three gradient coils. There's the X gradient, the Y gradient, and the Z gradient. Okay, and so what do these mean? So typically we'll be talking about, we're always going to be focused on the Z component of the field, okay, the component along the axis. And we're going to look at its variation in X, Y, and Z. All right, so we're, this is the main field, the B0 field. So when we say B0 or B0, that's the main field from the big, this is the big field that we have from the big, uh, coil that we have. Okay. On top of that, we're going to add gradients. So we're going to have a dBZ dx, a dBZ dy, and the delta dBZ delta z. Okay. So these are how the field varies in the x, y, and z direction, but it's always the z component that we're going to be talking about. Right. So what we write is we write those partial derivatives as the gradient in x, the gradient in y, and the gradient in z. All right. So this is an example. So let's say this is the z direction. So this is the z direction here. Okay. So a gradient in z just means that as I move along in this direction, the field is getting stronger. So that's a gz is greater than zero, right? So the bz component is getting stronger as I move in the z direction. So that's a z gradient. And then the gy gradient is so this is the y direction. As I'm moving in the positive y direction, the bz field is just getting stronger. So that's all we mean. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how um, these gradients are formed. So the Z gradient is typically formed by two coils with uh, currents going in opposite directions. Okay, So this coil here would, um, so basically uh, you know, this coil generates a field going one way, and this field generates a coil going the other way. And so if you take the addition of those two coils, you get a linear gradient in the z direction. The, for the x, y gradients, it's a little more complicated. You actually need four pairs of coils at the minimum, and those create this, this gradient here, in this case, in the y direction. And so that's the, the, the most basic thing you can do. But as you can see, in practice, you end up with much more complicated designs, which are all sort of variations on that. But they are made so that you're, you have this, this, here, this field here only has a uniform gradient right at that plane. Okay? To get it over a large enough volume to be of interest, then you actually have to go to these more sort of computer-generated designs. All right. And these coils are driven by these huge amplifiers. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about gradient amplitude. So uh, a typical sort of maximum gradient amplitude would be five gauss per centimeter. Okay. So that means within one millimeter, I'm going to have a field change of the size of the Earth's magnetic field. Okay. So if I go from point A to point B, the field is only going to change by the Earth's magnetic field in one millimeter. All right. And then there's something called slew rate, which is how fast do I get to that strength. So for example, if I turn on the gradient and I want to get to 5 gauss per centimeter, there's going to be some rise time, delta t. Okay. And so in this case, if the slew rate was 200 tesla per meter per second, then it would take 250 microseconds to get up to that, that gradient. So this is where the noise comes in MR systems. We're always switching these gradients on or off. If we didn't have gradients, there would be no noise uh, for the most part. So the loud sounds you hear are these gradients switching on and off. Okay? And these are driven by these really huge amplifiers. So a typical uh, amplifier now is one megawatt. But tip in the future generations, they're talking about two megawatt, three megawatt amplifiers. Okay? And just for uh, comparison, um, when I was doing this slide, I think two years ago, I looked up for the Metallica 2017 World Tour. If you went to a Metallica concert uh, in this stadium, it was only 367,000 watts. Okay, so in an MRI system, you have more. You could basically have enough watts to, to do a raw concert. Okay, with, with with a lot to spare. All right, and so the um, what you're hearing is essentially these the gradients have are, have these time-varying currents running through the coils. And they have 
you, so you have a current in the presence of a large field, right? The, the, the main field, like the three Tesla or the seven Tesla field. So what's going to happen to that current in the presence of the main field? What force is it going to experience from physics? Anyone? There's a name for this field. Oh, the force. What force does it feel? Lorentz. Lorentz. Yeah, it's going to feel the Lorentz force, right? So everyone remembers the Lorentz force, hopefully? Okay. So uh, anytime you have a current in the presence of a field, there's going to be a force exerted on that. Okay. And so essentially, as these fields are going, they start, these coils are actually vibrating. And so the grating coil is essentially like this loudspeaker. It's vibrating. And, and, and the switching that we use is typically at the audio frequency, and so that's why you feel um, this. So you can actually hear it, and for certain sequences, you actually feel it. Uh, there are certain designs. If, if they haven't designed it well to be sort of all force balance, it sometimes feels like you're in a washing machine. It's just like, just like that. Okay? So it's a very, um, it's a very sensory experience. And, and so the, one of the cool things I like about MRI is from a research point of view is if I have a student or staff member scanning me, I can tell exactly if they're doing what I asked them to do just by listening. Okay? Because I know that's not the right pulse sequence. You didn't run the right pulse sequence. Or you forgot this. Or you forgot that. Okay, just by listening, because I know what the gradients should be. All right. Okay, so then when we put it all together, we have this very complicated system where we have the magnet, but we also have the RF chain that's putting energy in and receiving it. We have the gradients that are, um, you know, creating these changing magnetic fields. We have this whole control system, which we call the pulse program and measurement and control. And that's driven by software. And that, those are called pulse sequences. And that's the part of research that um, has really been innovated by academia because they make their source, they make their software platforms open so anyone can come in. And just by changing um, the way you read out those pulses, there is essentially an infinite number of ways you can do MRI, which we'll see. And, and then there's all this stuff post where you got the data, how do you make it into an image and storing and everything like that. All right. Okay, so now, so that's sort of an overview of um, the, the hardware. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to start talking about how do each of these components work and what do they do. So what we have is we have the magnet we're going to find. Yes? What's a shim? Oh, okay. The shim is essentially um, um, you get this magnet, right, and you, what you want is a very uniform field. But because it's hard to get things uniform, we add some additional wires that are like shim coils that we can use to uh, make the field uniform. And so there is this thing, um, every time you do an MR system, a scan, there's always this process called shimming, where you're actually trying to get the fields a little more uniform. Okay, okay so, um, so there's four main steps that we're going to talk about over the course of the next few weeks. One is the magnet. Its main job is to create polarization, to create some magnetization that you can work with. Okay. The next thing is the RF coil. It has two jobs, but first we're going to talk about its transmit role. It's going to transmit energy into the system, and it's going to excite the spins into a higher energy state. Right. The third thing we're going to talk about is the gradient coils. Yes, question. Oh, there's not on Canvas under week five? Okay. Um, just give me a minute. Let me see if I can pull them up. That's really weird because I loaded them and I downloaded them from the site. With Professor McVeigh? Okay. All right. Let's see if. Dual authentication works, great, all right. Oh, there you go, all right. Sorry about that. Oh, so I could download it, but no one else can see it? Okay, that's probably what happened. Um, okay, can you look at it now? See you now? Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, feel free to interrupt me earlier. 
next time, okay? So everyone can see that now? Okay, great. Yeah, in the old Triton Ed, you didn't have to publish things, so I, I sometimes forget that you have to publish. So, okay, um, that's great. So let me just make sure this is good. Okay, uh, so the grading coils, their job is to do something called encoding, and this is where we're going to get into sort of Fourier theory. And so the idea is, we're going to actually the grading coils are what allow us to actually make the data. So it's actually the Fourier transform of the object, okay? And then the last step is we're going to receiving, and so we're going to receive the, the, the energy from all those spins, and every time we do that, we're essentially integrating over all the spins, okay? And that integration is the last step in the Fourier transform, okay? So if you remember the Fourier transform, we just do it in 1D, it has the form g of x, e to the minus j, 2 pi, kx, x, dx, if we're just in 1D, okay? So this part here does that. It, it essentially multiplies by a complex exponential. And we'll go into this in much more detail, but just to give you an overview, the gradients are what does the complex exponential, and this part does the integration, okay? So the really cool thing is every time you're having an MRI done on you, you're essentially having Fourier transforms of your body done all the time, okay? And then what we're going to work up to is we want to understand, the thing about MRI is with a single MRI system, you can come up with hundreds and hundreds of types of images, lots of different information, which makes it really unique in terms of other modalities have that to a certain extent, but I think MRI sort of outpaces all the other modalities in terms of how much information you can get out of the body. So the most common use of MRI, obviously, is to get really nice pictures of, of the body. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about how you want to diagnose disease with these pictures, but these are... This is the same brain, just with different parameters. And we'll talk about, and each parameter sort of highlights something different about that brain. But just by changing the software, we get these three different pictures, okay? Uh, if we change the software a little bit more, we can actually highlight the iron in the blood vessels, okay? If we change the software some more, we can get a, a view of the blood flow in all of the vessels, okay? If we change the software some more, we can actually do maps of your brain. Which this is really astonishing. It means that I can put you in the magnet for eight minutes and I can end up with a wiring diagram of your brain. Okay. And then if you do change it some more, we can actually put you in the scanner and look at what your brain's doing in real time. Yes. So one of the big costs for MRI is obviously the capital cost. Yes. Yeah, it depends on whether you're doing research or clinical, but like research here, you know, the cost is like 600 bucks an hour, which is pretty reasonable. I think on the clinical side, it really depends where you go. I mean, it could be a um, thousand or more dollars per hour or two thousand. It really goes by the procedure as opposed to the hour there. And then there's the radiologist has a professional fee associated with that. Um, but that is certainly an issue. So in, in, in developing countries, they're trying to find cheaper ways of doing MRI. So one of it is reducing the helium, reducing the siting costs, and also um, making it so that, um, you know, even, even to have these huge amplifiers, right, you can't really do, necessarily do that if you don't have the proper infrastructure. So people are actually even looking at, you know, what are portable ways of doing MRI. So yeah, MRI does, is very expensive. Yeah. And there are certain places where there might only be one MRI in the whole country. Okay. Here in San Diego, we probably have... I don't know, 50 at least, okay? If you think about Sharp and Scripps and UCSD and all those private imaging, okay? So over the course of the next four to five weeks, we're gonna talk about each of these modalities and, and how do you get the MRI system to give you this information, right? Okay, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is spin. So this is, we're not gonna go into too much detail, but we're gonna just give you a sense of what it is so the whole basis of MRI is the fact that elementary particles have this property called spin. It's a fundamental concept in quantum mechanics. But for the purpose of this course, we're just going to take a very classical view of it. And this is not correct, but it's a very useful analogy. 
And so, for example, if you think about a, um, a proton, and we're mostly going to be talking about protons in this class, or hydrogen protons. If you look at a proton, a proton is, you could say, is a charged sphere, right? And it, it, because it has spin, it also has its own intrinsic angular momentum. So you can think of a charged sphere rotating around its own axis. Okay? So it has two properties. One is that it has a um, it has angular momentum. The second property is it has its own magnetic moment. Okay, because it's, it's got a little current. If you have a charged sphere, it's current going around and around and around. So it's, we're going to say it actually has angular momentum and uh, magnetic moment. And those are the two properties that we need to, to look into. Um, okay. So, um, and the other thing that we need to know, and, and we're sort of lucky in the fact that the proton, the hydrogen proton has spin uh, that's detectable. Um, so typically spin one half is detectable, spin zero is not detectable. Okay. So um, there are certain properties. So for example, these are the these are the ones that we can sort of measure uh, with MRI. And the most prevalent one is the hydrogen proton. But we can also do things like um, look at fluorine 19 or sodium or phosphorus or uh, O17, which is not a natural isotope, but the idea is we're actually very lucky that the hydrogen proton has spin one half, because otherwise MRI just wouldn't be possible. All right. So um, if you think about a loop of wire, the classical magnetic moment is that the strength of this, this magnetic moment is going to be how much current is in there, the size of the loop of the wire, whoops, and then there's going to be some direction vector n hat. And so the first thing we want to do is realize that um, what happens if you put a loop like that in the presence of a magnetic field? Okay. So the contention is that um, if you look at these Lorentz forces, there's going to be uh, a very stable state where if you have a field pointing this way, when the magnetic moment is pointing in the same direction, that's a very stable state. And that's where the, the, the system would like to stay. Okay. Now another state you could put it in is here, where it's anti-parallel, okay? But that's not a very stable state, right? Any perturbation is going to try to move it back down to this state, right? So we've got a low energy state and a very high energy state, and we have all these states in between, all right? So that's the, the fundamental uh, thing we have to think about. So it's very similar to like a compass in the Earth's magnetic field, right? The compass needle wants a point along the field, you can always t turn it away um, from the field, but then it's always going to want to go back. Okay? So this is a very low energy state, very high energy state. So that's the main thing that if we have a magnetic field applied, um, there is going to be different states of energy. And there is then the Boltzmann distribution, which says that the probability of being a low energy state is much higher than being a probability of a low energy state. And this, it, it falls off exponentially. All right? Uh, so the best, the best explanation I've heard of this is if you think about a parking garage, right, like, you, like the Gilman parking structure or whatever. So it's got like whatever, four levels or whatever, okay? So where's the lowest energy state? It's at the bottom, right? And assume there's like no A, B, or S parking, right? You can just park anywhere you want, right? So you come in in the, in the, in the morning, most people will just want to park on the bottom level. There'll be a few people, like they just got a new car, they want to test it out, you know, they'll, they'll park at the top, you know? But essentially, you're going to have an exponential distribution of parking in this garage because it just takes more energy to go up to the top. So unless you really want to park at the top, you're just going to park at the bottom. Okay? So that's essentially the Boltzmann distribution. So what that means is that if you take that into account, if there's no magnetic field, so on this side here, there's no, magnetic, there's no applied magnetic field. Okay. So there's no preferred orientation for the magnetization to be in. It can be up, down, left, right, whatever. So what's the vector sum of all those random orientations going to be? Zero, right? If I have vectors pointing in every direction, if I sum them up, it's going to give me zero. So in this case, there, there's zero. So m naught here would equal zero. There's no net magnetization. On the other hand, if I put this magnetization 
into the presence of a large magnetic field, then there's going to be a preferred orientation. Okay. It doesn't mean, because of thermal motion, things can exist at other orientations, but on average, there's going to be preferred orientation. All right. And so therefore, um, it's, there's going to be a net magnetization. And that's, that net magnetization is a signal that we have to deal with. Okay. That's the whole basis of MRI, that we create this net magnetization, and then we manipulate it. All right. So when I put you into an MRI system, over the course of a few seconds, your body becomes magnetized, and you have a net magnetization. And now I'm going to start manipulating it. Right. And it turns out that net magnetization is proportional to the applied field. Okay, because the bigger that field, the more there's going to be a desire for the, the sort of a, a more, you know, there's more spins are going to be want to stay in this state. Okay. And so that explains a little bit why people are always trying to create larger and larger magnetic fields, because we're trying to get more magnetization, because ultimately the sensitivity of our experiment depends on how much magnetization we have to deal with. Okay. So, for example, we could do MRI at the Earth's magnetic field, but then we have like tens of thousands times less magnetization, and so it's not going to be very sensitive. Okay. Uh, why is this not letting me... Go to the next level. OK, there we go. OK, so the next thing we have to talk about is torque. And so uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but just sort of walk you through it. So essentially, if I have a B field here, and I have a, this is my magnetic moment that has its own inertia, uh, angular momentum. Uh, first thing is, because this has a force, this is a force, and this has got some, there's a force between these two. And that's going to cause a um, alignment. Okay, so if I have something here. It's gonna there's gonna be sort of a net torque on this to go into a line with the field. Okay, so that's that net torque that we're drawing. The, the mu cross v is that. Okay, so the torque vector in that case is just mu cross v right hand rule, and so it, it points in that direction. Now what we have to do is we don't just have a compass needle like this. We actually have a rotating compass needle. This compass needle is rotating around to an axis. So instead of just aligning here, what we're going to find is it's going to process around the main field. Okay, and that's the, that's the first really important concept that is really critical for how we make images with MRI is that spins process around the main magnetic field. Right. So and they process at an angular frequency which is called the Larmor frequency. Okay, and so omega is the Larmor frequency in terms of radians per second. Okay, and this is what we call the gyromagnetic ratio. And this is the, just the magnetic field. Yes. Yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to explain it with this, okay? So you won't see this on the video, so if, you, if you're not here, you can look online, <laughs> okay? Just Google, like, bikes, bike wheels and procession. Okay, so this is sort of our spin here, okay? Can everyone see this? If not, you can stand up if you need to. Okay, so is this in its lowest energy state or its highest energy state? Lowest, right? Okay, so if you imagine, like, this... Where, now, where's the vector? Where's the force vector here? What's the main force being applied to this? And it's pointing down, right? So imagine that this has a little vector pointing down. So this is its high, lowest energy state, right? Because it's everything is pointing down. What would be the highest energy state of this vector? Yeah, like this, right? But it's not stable, right? It's always going to go back to that. So that's sort of what spins do, right? They always want, preferably here. But if there's a lot of random energy, it could be anywhere, right? But on average, it wants this is its lowest energy state. Now, what we're going to find out with RF excitation, so I could just, so this is here, but if you think about this, this is just, if this is a magnetic moment, it's just rotating around its own axis, let's say. But it's very hard to detect that, it turns out. Okay. So what we want is, in RF excitation, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to perturb it to like here. Okay. And also, it's got some its own angular momentum, right? So it's going to process. So that's that's the picture you need to have in mind. Okay. If I have force 
and I also have angular momentum, it gives rise to precession. And this is essentially what the spins do. Okay. In this case, it's going uh, counterclockwise. Okay. How could I make it go clockwise? Spin it the other way, right? Yeah. Okay. So it actually turns out the spins are the same way. They're going to have a preferred way of processing, and we'll find out that they actually go clockwise. All right. And so then, if you imagine like there was like you know this this is this is the magnetization going around, right? Then this actually becomes much easier for us to detect. Okay. And we'll talk about that. Right. So that's essentially what we mean by precession. So obviously, you know we're not you know, we could do a whole lecture on precession and, and how weird it is and the fact that it allows you to ride a bike and all these cool things, but for now, for this class, just realize that spins process, and we're going to take advantage of that. That's the whole basis of making images of MRI, right? Okay, so now let's talk, a, so we already talked about units a little bit. Um, let me just make sure it's, the recording is still working. Yeah, okay. Um, and so the only thing we're going to add now is we're adding this gyromagnetic ratio, this gamma. So it is 26,752 radians per second per gauss. This is for hydrogen protons. And <coughs> typically, uh, for a lot of problems, we're going to work, work, want to work in like hertz per gauss instead. Okay, so that's cycles per seconds. So uh, the relationship is that's just gamma over 2 pi. So you'll, we'll use gamma over 2 pi quite a lot, all right? And that's typically 42,258 42, hertz per gauss, or sometimes we'll use 4257. You'll always be told what to use for that gyromagnetic ratio. So it, actually, in a few minutes, we'll have a problem where we'll, you'll actually use a, a different value of that, OK? Um, so as you see, different protons, uh, different uh, atoms have different gyromagnetic ratios, okay? And also, obviously, they have very different abundance. And so luckily, we are here in this regime here, typically for most MRI, where we have a lot of abundance, and also um, the gyromagnetic ratio is rather high, and so it's a, it has a very high frequency, which also helps us detect it, okay? Now, we can do imaging of these guys, but it's just much, much harder, because you, first of all, you're in the micromolar regime, or the millimolar regime, and also you have less gyromagnetic ratio. Um, just to give you a sense of the frequencies, uh, a 1.5 T system is 63.86 megahertz. So your spins, if I put you into 1.5 Tesla machine, your spins are processing 63 million times per second. So you can't really feel that, but they are doing that. If I put you in a 3 Tesla machine, they're going around 127 million times per second. Okay. Uh, so this, this table here is nice. It tells you sort of what those frequencies correspond to. Uh, so like 1.5 T is like analog TV. Uh, 3 Tesla is like civil aviation. So these are uh, very sort of frequency bands that we do use. And so because of that, the MRI system always has to be in, in what's called a shielded room. So we have to put it in this, this copper shielded room so that what we receive is from the sample and, it's, and we're not getting... Um, interference from other sources. Like if a plane flies over or something, we don't want to have to see that, okay? But there are times when the shield doesn't work or something else happens, and that's when you get artifacts, and we'll talk about that a little later. Okay, so then um, in general, we're dealing with lots and lots of spins, and so we'll talk about the magnetization vector. And so that is, if every spin is processing, then also the sum of all those spins is also processing around, okay? So we can by superposition, we can also look at it that way. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about, and this will lead to a problem that we'll, I'll give you guys, is um, RF excitation. So the, high, the idea behind RF excitation is the spin is here. Let's say this is the B-naught field. It's in this lowest energy state, but it's just like this. And so it's not really giving to a time-changing magnetic field that we can detect. Okay? It's very, very hard to detect a static magnetic field within an object because it's not radiating any information out. So what we want to do is we want to tip it away, and it starts processing. And now you can sort of see, if I have a coil over here, this coil is going to see a time-varying magnetic field. And so that's, what, so that's the excitation part, is we want to tip it away so it can process around. Okay. Typically, for this class, we'll typically use a 90-degree flip angle. 
But you know, any flip angles, okay, 30, 45, they're all used in MRI. But unless told otherwise, just assume it's 90 degrees uh, unless you're told otherwise. All right. So typically the way that's done, so we have this B naught field, which is like three Tesla, okay, which is essentially uh, let's say that's what is that, 30,000 times or 60,000 times the Earth's magnetic field? Okay. Super strong field. This and what we're going to do is, to tip this away, we're going to apply a very tiny field, which is what we call the B1 field, or the radio transmit field. And that field is actually very, very small. Okay? It's on the order of the Earth's magnetic field or less. Okay. So the question is, how do you um, tip something, how do you get something going with a very small field when it's, being, when it's influenced by a very large field? And the whole idea, it, it's similar to this, this problem here. So let's say there's a car. I'm not sure why this person has a car hanging in their backyard, but they do, right? And so this is like a 3,000 pound car, right? And if I tell you, I want you to go up there with your pinky finger and get this car moving, swinging back and forth, what would you do? How would you do it? Yes? Yeah, so you go and poke it, right? But you don't want to poke it that hard because you're going to break your finger, right? So how many times are you going to have to poke this thing? Okay, but I mean, yeah, so maybe you could do one very long poke, right? What's another thing you could do? Let's say you can't move. Let's say you have to stay here where you are and you want to get this thing moving. Right. Yeah, so you're poking it at what frequency? The resonant frequency of the system, which is like square root of L over G, right? Okay, so as long as you know the length of that, that thing and you, you know what G is, you can figure out how to poke it. And, and you do that all the time. Like if you, if you try to push someone on a swing, right? Like if you push them at the wrong time, it's not good, right? <laughs> so you always got to push them at the right time. So essentially, that's what we're doing with RF excitation. Uh, a little more sort of uh, applicable to um, MRI is imagine you're on a merry-go-round. Everyone's been on a merry-go-round at least once in your life. Okay. So imagine you have your friend standing on a merry-go-round, right? And you are you have a little thread attached to them. Okay. And you're you're sort of on the ground, and you want to pull your friend off the merry-go-round with this little string. How should you do it? What do you have to do? I know it's a really silly example, but okay. So let's say uh, Conan is on a merry-go-round, okay, and you want to, and I'm trying to get him off the merry-go-round, right? So he can go do his homework or something, right? And I have this string attached to him, but if I f apply too much force, the string is going to break. So how am I going to pull him off the merry-go-round? What would I physically need to do? Gradually do it for long. Yeah, so, what, what, so, so in this case, you're allowed to move, okay? Right. So the merry is going around. Let's say it's going around one time per second. Right. So what do you need to be doing? Go ahead. You need to basically run at the same speed around the merry Yeah, the so you, and then just pull off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, because you can't pull too hard, right? So in that case, it's more like your example of a long, slow force, but you're moving around with it. And that's essentially what the B1 field has to do. The spins want to process, right? So I can maybe tip it a little bit, but I have to keep going around with it to get it to tip all the way. Okay. So you can think of that merry-go-round as a little bit what we're going to do. So here's the basic idea. The spin wants to be there. Uh, it mostly wants to process around this, but if we apply a little B1 field, it, it also has a little bit of desire to process around this guy too, right? So we're going to take advantage of this perpendicular field to make it process a little bit away, but then we have to move this B1 field in the right way such that over time, so see it's processing and then it starts going away from its equilibrium and we're basically trying to perturb it away from its equilibrium. Okay, so that's the whole idea with RF excitation. Okay, so this is the question we asked. So we have this main field, so this very strong B0 field here, then we apply this perpendicular field here, okay? And this 
V1 field, this magnetization will want to process a little bit around this little tiny field, right? Okay, it mostly wants to process around this field, but it'll have a little desire to process around this field. Okay, but it's a very, very, like tens of thousands of times less desire to process around this field. But if we keep moving this field, then eventually it will follow it. Okay. So that's exactly what's shown in this picture here. So if you notice this field is going around the same, at the same rate as the precession. And so we can gradually get this magnetization to go down to the plane. In this example, t tell me if you can see what's going on with this example. What's happening there? So we're not very effective at getting the magnetization away from its equilibrium point, right? So what's wrong with that cyan arrow? Yeah, it seems like it's going too fast, right? It's as if you're running around the merry ground too fast. It's just not, your, your friend's not going to come off, okay? Um, so the next thing, the next concept we want to talk about, which we'll use basically for the rest of this course, is rotating frame of reference. And so essentially, uh, instead of thinking about the merry go going around, we're going to imagine we're on the merry-go-round, just like we are on the Earth, okay? So from the point of view of the merry-go-round, um, the person's not running around pulling you down. They're just in front of you, right? And so you want to sort of get into the frame of reference of, of the spin. So the picture we just showed was a laboratory frame of reference, you know, where we, how things physically occur. So the spin magnetization is spiraling down, but that's really a lot of stuff to keep track of. We don't want to have to keep track of all this spiraling down. So what we want to do is we want to be at the, the, the same frequency. We want to go around with the merry-go-round, such that instead of a person going like this, they're just falling down. Okay? And so that's shown by this thing here, where now, in this case, the, the field doesn't look like it's going around. Because it's at the same rate as we're going around, it looks like it's just there. It's always the same relative position. And so when we then look at it, the magnetization just goes like that. All right. So it turns out that the flip angle then is essentially um, given by the frequency of precession uh, and the integral of that over the time we're applying the V1 field. Okay. So this is a concept we'll call the flip angle, which is how much should we flip the spin down. All right. And um, and the, the, the frequency is going to be given by gamma times B1 of T. Okay? So essentially, um, if given any arbitrary waveform, if you just integrate it and multiply it by gamma, uh, you're going to get the flip angle. All right? So let me give you, what we're going to do now is we're going to spend a few minutes. Oh, so here's an example. So let's say I want a flip angle of pi over 2. Okay. And in this case, I'm going to apply a pulse for a duration of 400 microseconds. And I want to just know what, how big should I make that pulse. So basically, I just want the area of this. I'm going to get the area. And I'm going to multiply by gamma. And that should give me pi over 2. All right. And so what we're doing here is um, that's all we're doing here. So then the area, so the the area is just going to be equal to this is just going to be b1 times 400 gamma equals pi over two. Okay. So b1 is just going to be equal to pi over two over 400 over gamma. Okay, so that's essentially what we have here. We have the pi over 2 is here. This is gamma. Okay. And this is the 400 microseconds. And if I do that, I get 0.1468 gauss. All right. Um, so I'll also post an annotated version of these notes online, so you can always see these as well. OK, so here's an example. So we're going to actually try using the pole everywhere today. So um, this is the problem you have. You have an RF pulse of this form, A sync T over T. So it's going to look something like this, right? Uh, 
and this t is equal to 250 microseconds. Okay, so I want what's the amplitude that's going to give me a theta of 45 degrees? Okay, and you can assume that gamma over 2 pi is equal to 4,000 4, hertz per gauss. So all the math is easy. Yes? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you right now. It's, I'm going to open up the poll. It's going to be here. So let me just open up now so you can see that poll. So. so I'm not requiring people to have accounts. Um, so basically the way we're going to keep track is when you enter your uh, answer, and you can work in groups on this, so feel free to talk to your neighbor. Just put in brackets like the name of the people in your group. So your answer might be something like, you know, Joe... Sally, bracket, and then the answer would be A equals whatever. Can everyone see this now? If you go to pull ev.com slash B280A, everyone see that? Okay. You can see it? Okay. So we're just, we're just making sure it works today. So, you know, if you have any issues, don't worry about it. Um, we'll do this in future lectures as well. Um, so... So what we'll do is we'll give you about 10 minutes to sort of do this problem in groups. So feel free to pair up however you want. And one clue is you need to know the area of a sync function, right? So don't try to integrate a sync function, but try to think of what from Fourier theory will allow you to, to know what the area of a sync function is. Okay, so go ahead and uh, we'll regroup in about 10 minutes or so. If you have any questions, let me know, but otherwise we'll just be here. Yes. So do you want us to use 4,000 times 2 pi, or to use our gamma as 4,000? So gamma, gamma over 2 pi is 4,000 hertz per gauss, which is nice because then when you have pi over 4 on one side, the two pies, the pies cancel out, so you don't have to worry about pi. Yeah. Oh yeah, so let me just give a clarification for your, uh, I should have set this up differently, but just pick one of these A, B, C, D, E, F, or G's as your answer. So one of these is close to the correct answer, okay? So at the very least, when I ask for your answer, you can just take a wild guess, okay? 
And once again, these are just, these are not graded. They're just for participation. So don't worry about whether your answer is correct or not. It's just more I want you to think through the problem. Yes, question. Yeah, so the area is going to be A times something, right? Because the amplitude is part of the area, right? Yeah, so then, well, the expression for the area will have A in it. And so you want the area times gamma should equal pi over 4. Right. So the area, right, times gamma equals pi over 4. Question. I oh, know. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, I'll be gone pretty much next week. Yeah. That's fine. For me, uh, I might miss some tail end. Yeah, that's fine. So, yeah. Um, Don't worry. I mean, this is. Recorded. Yeah, they'll be recorded. Okay. So. I'm going to miss some quizzes, but. Uh, probably not, no. So just make sure you're. Uh, the only thing that will be issued is obviously the homeworks and then. The final project will be announced probably week seven or eight or something like that. Okay. So just you'll just want to stay up on top of that because they'll probably be in groups, and so you want to just be ready for that. Okay. Sure. Yeah.
Okay, if you could all submit your answers in the next minute or so. Uh, remember, put it all in one line. I have some answers and no names, and I have names and no answers, so just one line, and we'll talk about it in one minute. Okay, due to time, let's start talking about that. So we've got some E's, some C's, some D's. Uh, there was one, yeah, okay. I don't know, LOL. Um, <laughs> e, B, okay, so we've got B, C, D, E, mostly F's though, so that seems to be the most popular choice. So let's see what the, the answer is, okay? So I want an area of a sync function. So I want to integrate the sync from t over t uh, over all time, right? But you don't really want to have to integrate a sync function, right? Because that's going to take some time to do. It's sine pi x over pi x, and you know you don't want to do that. So what you want to do is you want to realize that this is just e to the minus j 2 pi f of t dt at f equals 0. OK? So it's just going to be the Fourier transform at zero of this function, OK? So then we go that sinc of t over t transforms to sinc rect of t f, OK? So when I put in f equals zero, what is rect of zero? One, right? So this just equals t. So the area of that sinc function is just a times t, okay? And so, and the reason why we're using sinc functions a lot is you'll see sinc functions a lot over the next few weeks, so we might as well get used to them today. Um, and actually, if you go and look at MRI, sinc functions are everywhere. If you put an oscilloscope on and you look at the waveforms, they're all sinc functions. If you look at the received signal come out, you see lots of sinc functions. So it's not just some theoretical thing. It is actually used every day, okay? So we know the area is A times T, and then times gamma should equal pi over 4. Okay. So then we can just solve for A. So A is equal to pi over 4 T over gamma. Okay. And I believe if you work that out, you get 0.125. Gauss. Okay, so F is the closest answer. All right. So, any questions on that? Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to evaluate this at F equals zero. Oh, you mean this one, this th down here? Okay, so I'm just saying if I want sync, I want an integral of sync of t over uh, t over big T, um, then that's also equal to the integral of sync of t over t times e to the minus j t by f t when f is equal to zero, right? Because when I put f of zero in there, the e to the zero is just one. So it's just a trick that you should know about that the area of a function is simply the value of its Fourier transform. At the um, at the center of case space, and actually, that's a term that's something we'll revisit as well. That because the, it turns out that when we look at imaging, the center of case space has a very special meaning. 
because it's essentially the average of your image. And so whenever we're looking at things, we're always going to be looking at the center of k space, where f equals 0, or kx equals 0, or ky equals 0. And so you just sort of want to get in mind that that's just the mean value of your image, or the area of your image. Okay. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. So in fact, we are at the end of our hour, so we're actually going to stop now. So um, we'll, we'll continue on Wednesday, um, and then I'll be here for office hours. So if you want to have questions, make sure you're here at the beginning. If you want to go and come back, just let me know you're being coming back. Otherwise, when the room's clear, I'll probably just leave. <laughs> okay.